we do lend our spirits to the spirit of the living God within us, that out through the vessel of our being, you pour forth your wisdom with mighty clarity. We do thank you for we have wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of that spirit that you've so richly given to us in a redemption so beautiful. Father, we believe and receive that the burden of ignorance is dematerialized to your glory. And everybody says, Amen. Well, uh, we'll go straight into our conversations on the unmarried and the married state. Glory to God. Yeah, so our conversations on the unmarried and the married state. Glory to God. Well, you want to turn with me very quickly then to Ephesians and chapter 5, where we have taken uh, a text for a while now. Ephesians and chapter 5, and I'm going to read to you verse 1. Be you therefore followers of God as dear children. The word followers there is a word that means to imitate or to mimic. Yeah, so be you therefore uh, uh, followers or imitators of God as dear children. In other words, uh, in salvation, we find the life of God in man. And in that life, of, uh, that life of God in us is the conduct of God in us. And in that conduct, we are found to be imitating God. It's not so much us struggling to be like him. It is us recognizing that he has made us like himself. So his spirit in us is proof that he is in us. And then our, our spiritual development or our mimicking him is simply coming under the influence of that spirit. So Ephesians 5.1, be you therefore imitators of God as their children. That is the big message of Paul. Then it says in verse 2, walk in love as Christ also has loved us. Yeah, and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savour. Notice that it says that the way we imitate God is in the way that Christ gave himself for us. Now, notice that Jesus did not give himself for God. He gave himself for man. God became a man. And as a man, he gave himself for man. We were the ones that needed God to give himself that way. And God was open to giving himself as the offering or the sacrifice. In other words, as you read your Bible, it is very easy to come to the false conclusion that man needs to bring a sacrifice to God in order for God to be pleased. But actually, in Christ, we see the fact that Christ is God, right? Bringing himself as the sacrifice as the offering that for man. So man needed a sacrifice. God willingly, as an act of his love, became the sacrifice. So God is sacrificial, and we see God, uh, God's sacrificial nature or perspective or slant in the sacrifice of Christ. So Jesus sacrificing himself for us is God sacrificing himself for us so follower of God or imitator of God will be us sacrificing ourselves for the same people that Christ sacrificed himself for. Who did Christ sacrifice himself for? Us. That is humanity. So Christ sacrificed himself for humanity, not for God. Yeah. Instead, it was God that sacrificed himself for man. So we also sacrifice ourselves for the same man. Yeah, that God sacrificed himself for. So to walk in love is to live sacrificially for others. It then goes all the way in verse 18 of the Ephesians 5. And it then says, be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the spirit. What spirit? The spirit is what Christ gave in the redemption. The spirit is what Christ gave. Now it says be filled with the spirit. That means come under the influence of. That means be, uh, be influenced by the Spirit of God. Now, what is the Spirit? Look at 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians and chapter 13, and I'm going to read verse 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost with you all, amen. There's no B there. The B is italicized. With you all. What is with us all? The communion or which means the supply. The supply of that particular Spirit is with us all now. Now, what is that supply? It is the love of God. 
What is the love of God? It's the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the, the grace or the giving of the Lord Jesus Christ was that he gave us the spirit as the particular demonstration of the gift. So Jesus gave himself and what he gave himself to us as is the spirit that is in us. So Jesus gave himself to us as a spirit in us. Is that clear? So the gift of redemption or the gift of the grace of God or the gift of the love of God is the spirit of God in man, which is with man and makes the man a believer. So go back to Ephesians 5. So in Ephesians 5, when he says, uh, and walk in love as Christ also had loved us and has given himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling sabal. So what did Jesus do? He gave. He gave himself. And in giving himself, he gave us the spirit. Right? So the spirit that made Christ give himself, that same spirit is in the believer now. And uh, what did that spirit make Christ? It made Christ an offering and a sacrifice to God. That spirit was then given or supplied to us in the resurrection. So in the sacrifice of Christ, the spirit of God, the spirit of Christ became the spirit of man or became the spirit of the man that believes. That is how we imitate God. It is by allowing his spirit in us to influence us. So when he says in verse 18, yeah, to be filled with the spirit, it means bring yourself under the influence of that supply which Jesus gave to man. Now, how does that work? Yeah, that speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. So in other words, uh, verse 20, giving thanks always for all things unto God. So the spirit-filled life or the, the spirit that caused Christ to be the sacrifice right, causes us to give thanks to God. And what then do we give to one another? Well, verse 21, submitting yourselves one to another. Submitting yourselves one to another. Let me say it again. Uh, it is all a waste. If the spirit given in the new birth does not, is not yielded to until a man begins to submit himself to other men. Right? You see, uh, in Hebrews 13, we are told to submit ourselves to those that teach us. Right in First Peter two thirteen, we are told to submit ourselves to. Uh, if I look at it, Hebrews and chapter thirteen, verse seventeen. See what it says. It says, "Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves." submit yourself. So we are told to submit ourselves to those that teach us or train us in God's word. Then in First Peter and chapter two and verse thirteen. Yeah, we are told to submit ourselves to every ordinance of man. Then in verse uh, 18, servants are told to submit themselves to their masters. Right? Then you see in Romans and uh, chapter 13, Romans quickly, Romans and chapter 13. Yeah, it is said, Paul said, let every soul be submitted unto the higher powers. So we are submitted to the higher powers. We are submitted to the ordinance of men. We are servants submit themselves to their masters. And we are told that as believers, we, in Ephesians 5, look at Ephesians 5. In Ephesians 5, we, in verse 21, we are then to submit ourselves to one another. Submit yourselves one to another in the fear of God or in the awe of God. What is the fear of God or the awe of God? Well, it is that verse 1. Be you therefore followers of God. So my awe of God is my imitating him. As a dear child, how is that demonstrated? That as Christ, verse 2, has, given, has loved us by giving himself for us in sacrifice, we also love our brethren in giving ourselves over to them. Amen. So if you go back to that verse 20 and 21, so we submit ourselves one to another. In other words, the believer practices submitting himself to another believer or submitting ourselves to another believer as a practice of the spirit-filled life. In Ephesians 5.24, therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, or that word is submitted, so the believer is submitted unto Christ. Now, uh, uh, again, uh, who is the one that submitted first? Verse 2, Christ also has loved us and has given himself for us. So Christ was the first one to give himself, not considering just himself, but us. You go to First Peter. First Peter and chapter 3. It says, likewise, you wives, 
be in submission. That the, the, the KDV says subjection is the same Greek word for submit. So likewise, your wives, be in submission to your own husband. Likewise. So the, the wife's submission to the husband is not a unique thing. Let me say it one more time. Likewise, you wives, be in subject, submission. So the wife's submission to her husband is not unique. It is likewise. It is in the same manner as, now, in the same manner as what? Well, 1 Peter 2, 21, right? It is that same manner as in verse 21, for even here unto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his, in his steps. So likewise, you wives. So why are the wives submitting to their husbands? Because Christ submitted to us in that he, forbear, he was forbearing and he suffered for us as the offering or the sacrifice for sins. Amen. So, and he left us an example to follow. Of course, it's true that we tell believers about the sufferings of Christ, but then often believers don't understand that in the sufferings of Christ, we have an example of our own uh, following in the same steps. What does the sufferings of Christ look like? He says, he did not sin, neither was any gal found in his mouth. In other words, uh, submission of Christ is that he did not speak anyhow. Right? Uh, verse 23 says, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. So he doesn't do tit for tat. So when I do tit for tat with human beings, that means in my relationship with them, I am not submitted unto them. When he suffered, verse 23, he threatened not. So the tendency not to resort to threatening. When I forgo what I feel is my right to threaten another person, what have I done? I have submitted to them like Christ submitted to us. Right? So he committed himself to him that judged righteously. Right? And then we are then told that uh, in his own sins, in his own body, in his own self, in his own complete being, he bare our sins. So Jesus, as the sacrifice for sins, when he was reviled, he did not revile. When he was uh, suffering, he did not threaten. That is the example that he left us to follow. Likewise, you wives. So in other words, the submission of the wife is not in a level by itself. The submission of the wife is in the example of Christ. So when a wife submits to her husband, she's simply following the example found in Christ, which is the same example that every single believer is to follow. Hallelujah. So in, in verse 18, 1 Peter 2, 18, when servants are told to be subject to their masters, why? It is because Jesus also left us an example. In verse 13, when saints are told to submit themselves to every ordinance of men, why? For the Lord's sake. What is the Lord's sake? That is the example that we find in the Lord in verse 21. So when I submit myself to men, it is because Jesus himself submitted himself to me. So our submission to one another is us imitating God. So God himself has submitted himself to me in the sacrifice of his son. And in the sacrifice of Jesus, I then find myself submitting myself unto other believers. Now, go back to Ephesians. Ephesians and chapter 5. So it says in verse 21, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. What is the fear of God? That example, that footstep, that, uh, that uh, uh, illustration that we'll find in the sacrifice of Christ. We submit ourselves one to another in that. Why do I submit myself to you? Not because of you, but because of Christ's example. But Christ's example is about you. Therefore, in the example of Christ, I begin to care for you. So my submitting to you is not because you uh, actually did right or did wrong, but because he has shown me that is the full steps to follow. Yeah, it says walk in love, Ephesians 5, 2. Walk in love, even as Christ loved us and gave himself for us. That's, that is submitting ourselves one to another. So the husband will submit to the wife. And the wife will submit to the husband. Let me say it again. The submission in the Bible, it's the submission we find in God in Christ, right? We'll find in Christ in redemption that we'll find in the believers in their relationship with men. Any relationship from God to man always involves submission. And the first person to submit is God. And then in his submission, we then get to understand how to relate to other people. God's submission to us in that wonderful redemption is our example of submitting to the same people that Jesus submitted to. Amen. That's very important. Look at Matthew and chapter 20. Matthew 20. And we're going to go all the way to uh, verse uh, 28. 
It says, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to minister. That means to serve and to give his life a sacrifice or ransom for many, which is submission. So Jesus submitted to us. Jesus says the reason why he came was so as to submit to us. So redemption is the submission of God to man in that God is serving man to the benefit of man. Glory to God. Now look at Philippians. There's something important here that we need to get. Philippians and chapter 2. Philippians 2, and it says in uh, verse 2, Paul is saying, uh, if I look at verse 1, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit. So what do we find in that supply of the Spirit? Yeah, it says any bowels and mercies. So our merciful, tender, uh, uh, tenderly, soft-hearted yeah, uh, uh, the slant to want to serve others is a it is uh, it is the consolation that we have in Christ, and it says in verse two, fulfill you my joy that you be like minded, having the same law, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing that submission, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, that's humility. Let each esteem the other better than themselves. So submission means I relate to you and I prioritize you. Verse 4 says, look not every man on his own things. That means don't be selfish. So in other words, submission is the end of selfishness. But every man also on the things of others. In other words, uh, submission means I am concerned about your welfare. And I live my life not so as to please myself, but to please you. So as to edify you or to serve you, to minister to you. I actually esteem you better than me. Now, you are not the one telling me I'm nothing. No, I'm the one making myself of no reputation. Yeah, look at it again. So I make myself of no reputation in that I make myself your servant. And in doing that, I am serving you. And that is the heart of sacrifice, the heart of service, which is called submission. Likewise, you wives. Amen. Now, look at Titus. Titus and chapter 2. Titus and chapter 2. And I'm going to read to you uh, verse 3. It says the aged woman, or you can say the women who are elders. That was saying the women who are elders, yeah. Uh, li uh, likewise, that they be in behavior as becoming holiness. Now, what is he talking about? Look at verse one. Speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. So, what we are reading is sound doctrine. What do you find in sound doctrine? Well, we tell the older woman, yeah, the more mature woman. Likewise, that they be in behavior, or that means in conduct, has become holiness, a life separated to God, in other words. Not false accusers, not given too much wine, teachers of good things. Sound doctrine again. So the, the, the women that are elders are to teach good things, which is sound doctrine. Now look at an example of sound, sound doctrine, verse 4. That they, that is this woman, may teach the younger woman to be sober. Amen. That they may teach the younger women to be sober, to love their husbands. Wait. So there is a way that a young Christian woman, our young sisters in the Lord, are meant to love their husbands. Do you understand? Now, that tells you something. You know, that helps you understand. That what did he say they should teach the women here? Yeah. Titus 2.4. That they may teach the younger women to be sober, to love their husbands right to love their husband you see that word love their husbands right is actually uh, uh an interesting uh greek word yeah now notice this i want you to see that whatever is going on in that verse is what is called sound doctrine sound doctrine now so when we are talking about sound doctrine sound doctrine uh, also involves yeah to, uh, teaching the woman right or teaching a saint how to conduct himself in marriage. Now, sound doctrine is not what kind of party do you throw as a believer in doing a marriage. Now, the sound doctrine doesn't bother itself so much with, is it 10 people, 5 people, 20 people, 200 people? Was it a carnival? Was it overnight? Was it 10 weeks or 7 weeks? Right? How many rams or goats or chicken or ducks or ducklings were killed? Now, that is totally unimportant. Why? Because the epistles do not major on that. The epistles assume 
that in fulfilling what it takes for a man to be a married to a woman, that has been done, or a woman married to a man that has been done. Now that they are married, it then gives them instructions as saints. Are you there? So Titus and chapter two. Did you see that? Titus and chapter two. Very, very important. Titus chapter two, it says that they may teach younger women to be sober, to love their husbands. Now, so uh, teaching the younger women to love their husbands is sound doctrine. Yeah, a sound doctrine. Well, somebody says, well, I don't know about all this teaching people about uh, uh, the conduct of a believer in marriage. Well, it means that you are not a lover of sound doctrine. Yeah, because in sound doctrine, we teach women to love their husbands. You know what is funny? In that verse 4, yeah, there's something interesting is going on. It, you see that word, love, to love their husband. It is one word in the Greek. Yeah, so that they may teach the young women to be sober, yep, to love their husband, one word. And that word, to love their husband, means husband love. That's, what, that's the Greek word, husband love. And then to love their children is also one word. Yeah, it is child love. So to love your husband is philandros. Yeah, to love your children is a philotechnos. Now, in other words, it, the love for a child, child love, and then the love for a husband. So there is love for husband. You know, the Bible talks about brotherly love. The Bible talks about, you, you know of agape. What's agape? Agape is the commitment that does not consider the reaction of the other. That's agape. Agape means I put myself or in any, any situation possible for the good of another or uh, for the benefit of another. Now, funny enough, there's good agape, there's bad agape in the Bible. Don't assume that agape yeah, necessarily means the God kind of love. No. Agape is simply the love of commitment. It is a love that commits to another and it could be to, to do the other bad or to do the other good. <laughs> now, anyway, but here the Bible is not talking about agape. See, in Ephesians 5, all your enemies type us 2.5. Yeah, Titus 2, 5, in Ephesians 5 and verse 25, when he says, in verse 25, when he says, husbands, love your wives. Now, th that word there is agape. So agape your wives. And agape, again, is simply the love that is not based on feelings, but a love that is a settled disposition, a commitment to, right? It's a decision. It's love that is a commitment to, that bases its actions on itself, but the benefit is uh, re uh, realized by the other or the, uh, or the trouble. So the consequence of the love is felt by the other, but the determination to love that way is by the one that is doing the loving. That is agape. Now, but, so when the Bible says, husband, love your wives, you know what is funny? Actually, in verse 25, when it says in Ephesians 5, husband, love your wives, that's agapao. Uh, as Christ also loved the church, that's agapao. And then it says in um, verse 28, so ought men to love their wives, wives that's agapao. Uh, and then it says, he that loveth his wife loveth himself, that's agapao, agapao, agapao everywhere. Now, it then says in uh, verse uh, uh, 33, nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love that agapao. So every single place where the husband is talked about, it is agape, agape, agape. In other words, it is not a feeling. It is not, I feel happy today. No, it is a settled disposition having nothing to do with the relative goodness or badness of the recipient. It is a commitment to another, even at your own peril, right? That is agape. And agape is used in the Bible, both negative and positive. Oh, somebody said, you know, uh, in those days we used to believe uh, from reading studying books that agape was a word that was coined by Jesus. No, not at all. Agape existed in Greek literature and is simply a Greek word that talks about the love that is based on commitment. So God agaped in that God committed himself to us at his own detriment but for our own good. But men also agape in that they commit themselves to men and their agape could kill the men or their agape could help the men. So man's agape is flaky. God's agape is for the good of the recipient of the agape. And so the Bible says in Ephesians 5.25, so ought men to agape their, their wives. So men are found in the God agape, not the man agape. The man agape in the Bible, so we don't have enough time to search all the agape words, but the use of agape in the Bible uh, is not always good. So, and that's it. Whenever agape is not good, it is referring to something men do to men, 
right? But the agape of the, the agape of the epistles that the Bible encourages the believer to be in is the agape found in Christ. That is the commitment for the good of another and putting in oneself in arm's way. So Jesus sacrificing himself for us, that's agape. Yeah, and there's some other men that will say, you know what? We will not eat, we will not bath, we will not brush our teeth, we will not sleep until we kill you. That's also agape. <laughs> yeah, in other words, that would be we are committing ourselves that no matter what you do, we will bring about a result. That's agape. That's the nature of agape. Agape delivers because all it needs in order to bring about the delivery is itself. Right, the recipient is just the recipient of the consequence. So, when the Bible says in Ephesians 5 25, it, again, husband, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. It is husband, agapao your wives, even as Christ also agapao the church. That means he sacrificed himself and gave himself for it. So, husband, you sacrifice yourself to give yourself for the good of your wives. Now, Titus. I said all that to read Titus. So we have seen in Ephesians 5 that love, 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 love is agapo, 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 agapo. Then in Titus 2, in that verse 4, it's talking about what do we teach the younger women? It says that they may teach the younger women to be sober, to love their husbands. So the younger woman there will be the younger married woman. It's, why is it saying younger? It will be those believers that is to be people that are fresh, it to be believers that are freshly into marriage or uh, be, uh, pe married people that are freshly believers, one of the two. So it's either the person is married and then is now coming into uh, Christ fresh or the person is uh, a young believer who is married, one of the two. But whatever the case is, it, it, what it's saying is we teach these things to the married woman. So it says that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands. The point I'm saying is, you see that love there? That's not agapao. The, it actually, to love their husband is one Greek word. It, it is the word philandros. It simply means husband love. Yeah, husband love. So husband love is specially taught to uh, sisters as believers why? Because husband love will be finding its expression in the love that we find in God. Amen. So to love their husbands, actually, that, that's not agape. It will be there is a love, a husband love, that a woman, a wife, a sister in the Lord is to be taught. Now, if you've been listening, what is that love called? It is called submission. Now, it says that they may teach the younger women to be sober, that means they're in their right mind. Yeah, they are actually bringing about a, a phenomenal intelligence. In other words, it is an intelligent thing. Look at that word again. When it says that it should be sober, right? What does the word sober mean there? Well, the word sober uh, there means to, uh, to bring to the correct senses, to bring to the correct mind, to consider correctly. Now, so when it says that they may treat the younger women to be in the correct mind, what mind? Let this mind be in you that was in Christ. What would that mind do? It doesn't consider itself. It considers the object of his action. In this case, it is called love the husbands, which is one Greek word, philandros, which simply means husband love. And then it says to love their children, which would be child love. Are you following? Now, so, but remember, it is taught. Then it says in uh, verse 5, to be discreet. Now, this is what husband love looks like. It is discreet. It is chaste. It's a keeper at home. It is good. It is obedient to their own husband. You know what is funny? Somebody say, hey, hey, particular, I like this one. But the trouble is, you see that word obedient there? I don't know why the King James translators do, did that, but it's the very famous word that we've been reading everywhere as subject or submit. It's the same word. Right, so the, the, it is saying that oh, that they be submissive to their own husband. Submissive, why? Because it's talking about the love of husbands, husband love. So husband love is being submissive to your own husband. So a woman's love for her husband is the submission that she has to him, because that is the example that we find in Christ. Now, it says that the obedient, or really, the word is submission, that they be submitted to their own husbands, that the word of God, what's the word of God? The testimony of God, the gospel, was the gospel that Christ was made a sacrifice for our sins in order to release us from those sins. So, uh, they, are, they are submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God, that gospel that we preach, be not blasphemed, right? Be not blasphemed. In other words, if I, 
a believer in whom the spirit of God dwells, right? Live my life in such a way that I do not live in the in being filled with the spirit. That means I don't serve other brethren. I make the gospel to be blasphemed, right? In other words, my action, yeah, my action is actually, my, my action is actually invalidating the very word, the very logos, the very message, the very logic of God, right? So the very logic of God blasphemed. That word blasphemed, see what it means. Uh, the, the word simply means uh, that you are speaking reproachfully, you are reviling, or you are actually uh, opposing. So the way a man or woman, in this case, a wife, a wife is submissive to her husband because that is what the word of God is. The word of God is the submission of God to us in the man, Jesus. And so if that spirit is in me, then or since that spirit is in me, I will be found to be submissive. For that is the example that Christ left us to follow. Now, what if I don't do that? Then the word of God is blasphemed. I am found to be contradicting in my conduct, the very, the very reality of the spirit of God in me. Now, follow closely. It then said, it then said in verse six, young men likewise exhort to be sober. So how many are to be sober? The young woman, who is the young wife? Because she has a husband. And then the young man, likewise, we mean the young man that, that is the husband of that woman. So in other words, the women and the men or the brothers and the sisters are to be exhorted to be sober-minded. So it is a mindedness. What is that mind? Look at Philippians. Philippians and chapter 2. Philippians 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. What is that mind? Verse 4. Look not every man on his own things. That means don't be selfish. Don't be self-centered. Don't be into these things for your own good. What am I going to get in it for myself? No, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. So Jesus was looking on our own things, not his own things. And that was why he was able to get himself sacrificed for us. If he was considering himself and not considering us, he would actually have tried to save himself by not get, uh, allowing himself to be sacrificed. Is that clear? So let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Uh, uh, look at it again. He, he, uh, he, made, he, he made himself of no reputation. He took upon him the form of a servant, service. So the heart that serves is the heart that is the spirit of God in us, which is the fellowship of the spirit or what God gave in Christ or the example that we find in God himself. God submitted to us. He became a man became our servant so as to release us from sin. Amen. Now, so uh, in that, go back to that Titus, Titus 2. Titus 2 then, it then says in verse 6, young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. That means what you told to the wives in verse 4 is the same thing you will tell to the husband, the same mind. So whereas the man is having uh, the woman or the sister in verse four is instructed or taught to love their husband, which is to have husband love. What will we tell the uh, uh, husband? We'll tell the husband to have wife love, which is being sober. So somebody who has come to their right mind in Christ uh, as a believer, uh, as the husband, will develop wife love. That wife love is a commitment to the wife right to be discreet and chaste right uh, to be submissive to their own wife yeah let me say it again why am i using the word submit because submission is the heartbeat of the new covenant submission christ submitted to us god submitted to us in christ we submitted to one another we submitted to the ordinance of men we submitted to governors and rulers we submitted to our, our masters Wives submitted to their husbands. Husbands submitted to their wives. We submitted to one another. Likewise. So if you read Titus 2, 6, we are young men likewise. That means the instruction of Paul to the husband is the instruction of Paul to the wives. That is what Pastor Titus has been taught. Amen. That's what Pastor Titus has been taught. Look at 1 Corinthians. 
So in First Corinthians, uh, so if you ask Titus, what is the instruction uh, that we are to give the wives? It, is, it will say it's the same instructions that we are to give the husbands. Now, First Corinthians 7 and verse 33. Yeah, 33. We'll keep reading this until it becomes clear to our hearts. But he that is married, careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. Verse 34. Uh, it then says, there is a difference also between the wife and the virgin. The unmarried woman care for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married cared for the things of the world, how? She may please her husband. So the instruction to the wife is instruction to the husband. Just like in Titus, the instruction to the wife is instruction to the husband. In Ephesus, it tells the wife, it tells the wife be submitted. It tells the husband, be agape. Now, the agape is simply be submitted to. Because how do you demonstrate agape? You serve the person. And what is submission? To serve. You understand? So, the agape of the husband in Ephesians 5 is a service of his wife. Just like Christ gave himself for us in service as the sacrifice for sins. Amen. So, in other words, go back to Titus. Titus and chapter 2 is giving us a very interesting instruction. It says in verse 3, the aged woman likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given too much wine, teachers of good things. So, it then describes how the wives relate to their husbands and calls it, uh, when the wife relates in submission to her husband, that is a good thing. When that is taught by the, uh, by the, uh, by the elders unto the women, that is a teaching of a good thing, which in verse 1 of Titus 2, uh, Paul calls big sound doctrine. Now, but watch this carefully. Who does this teaching? It says there is a way in which it can be taught to yeah, the wives. When is it taught to them? It says, teach the young woman. That means these things ought to be taught unto the believer, the sister, very, very early on in marriage. Submission. Yeah, ought to be taught very, very early on. That in other words, to be sensible, to be of a sane mind or to be sober is simply to submit. Remember, submission is not obedience. Submission is actually uh, the fact that you want to serve. You are not, you are not being uh, abusive. We are not using our words anyhow. We are putting ourselves in, on the line for the benefit of our spouse. That is submission. Now, I want to see something very closely. You go all the way. Uh, see, who did he tell this to again? It says in verse, uh, verse 4, that they may teach the younger women. That would be the, 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 our sisters that are very early on in their marriage. They are to love their husbands. Uh, the, actually, a better rendition is to have husband love and then to have child love. You know what is funny? You know that if you don't teach people properly, yeah, when the husband becomes a father, it is possible for the father to overcome the husband and then the man is a good father and a poor husband. It happens. Let me say one more time. So a man marries a woman and then is doing good by the word of God. Then the woman gets pregnant and then gives back to a child, their child. Then the man as a father suddenly becomes more of a father than a husband. And what has happened at that point in time is he's actually not being sober. A, a sober man remains committed to his wife no matter what, right? Just like a sober woman, yeah, for Titus 2.4, the sober woman is taught about husband love. And husband love, yeah, it comes before child love. And child love is not a, repl a replacement for husband love. So you find so many women, they'll be like, you know what? Well, my marriage is not like good. I'm going to focus all my attention on the children. No, the Bible says you, te you teach the woman husband love. Husband law, why the children come and go. You teach the woman husband law as a, as a teaching. What is husband law? Submission to their own husbands. What is submission? The practice of the spirit of God, the spirit filled life. So it, remember, it is always right to submit. It might not be always right to obey. We always obey God. In fact, to submit to man is to obey God. Yeah, because that is what God teaches. Again, Titus 2.4, that they may teach the younger women to be sober. That means to be in their right mind. To love their husband. That means to have husband love. So husband love is a love that continues in a, womb, a sister's life forever. 
and then to love their children. Notice, husband love is not child love, but the two are not the same, and the two should not be conflated. The two should not be confused. Right? So it is possible for a person to be an excellent parent or poor spouse. But notice, the first thing you teach the, it makes sense though, the first thing you teach the sister is how to, uh, uh, how to mature in husband love. Because it is in husband love that the children are born. And then in the children being born, they it will then develop child love, not husband love. It's not well. The love I'm meant to show to my husband, I'm going to transfer to the children because I'm fed up with him. Not at all. There is child love and there is husband love and the women have to be taught husband love. Let me say it again. This husband love is a teaching called sound doctrine. It is not sitting people down and saying, well, uh, actually, you are from Tangayika or you are from Rhodesia. Uh, I wonder where I'm getting Rhodesia and these old uh, African words from. Yeah, so you are from Botswana. So we're going to teach you the Botswana way. No. Or that you are from uh, Canada. We're going to teach you the Canadian way. No. We're going to teach you the disciple of Christ's way, which is submission as the, as the expression of love. Right? So that's what the, the young woman as a young wife, is taught very early on in the marriage. Why? Because it's a understanding submission is a proof of maturity. Submission properly uh, taught, require, see, for, pro, for submission to be properly taught, the teacher must be mature. For the submission to be properly practiced, the student must be mature too. Now, very easily people conflate or confuse uh, obedience for submission. And what people are really saying many times when they say submit is let me command you. Mm -mm. Submission is not let me command you or not, let me rule you. Submission is a gift given by the person submitting. Amen. So, and that is the discreetness of the wife. Verse 5. So to be discreet, chaste, keep us at home, good, obedient to dear. So they are the one that, that obedient there is the Greek word again that means submission. So submission is a gift that the wife gives to the husband. Amen. Just like every other kind of submission, it is taught. This one is taught. Please, my dear friends, don't mistake this for what our elders tell us in the traditional context or what people tell us in the court or what people tell us traditionally in a, a Christian message. No, it is in the gospel. Right? Submission is found in the example that Christ left us to follow. Likewise, ye wives, First Peter three one. So the wife is a like the wife's submission to her husband is a likewise. It is not a rule given in creation. Oh, that oh, women have to not submit to men. Nah, 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 nah. To their own husband. Why? Because it's an example found in Christ. Amen. So verse four says that they may teach younger women for Titus two four to be sober to love their husbands. So a woman, a disciple of Christ, a uh, 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 our sister in the Lord, uh, as a wife, you need to expose yourself to the teaching of the word of God on the submission of Jesus. You see, Jesus' obedience unto death, even the death of a cross, is a mighty example for every single believer in our relationships with others. Who is it that teaches us? It's not a husband that is called to teach his wife submission. Look at it again. Uh, Titus 2.4. It says, in, so Titus 2.3, the aged woman likewise. It didn't say, oh, husbands, sit your wives down and teach them that they may learn to love you and they may learn to love your children and you teach them to be discreet, to be chaste. No, no, no. It, it actually said it's a teaching in itself, a sound doctrine in the local assembly and we have those that do it. It is, notice again, it is not the husband's job to teach the wife submission, except it is that by his own submission, is influencing her. You get the point? So the, the husband is not required to be the one that sits her down and say, okay, wife, open Ephesians 5. Read verse 21. Did you see? Can you see? Do you have eyes? Can you see it well? And then verse 22. So from today forward, no, 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 no. That's not what it is. It is something that is taught unto the wife as doctrine, sound doctrine. The Bible calls it the teaching of good things, Titus 2, 3. And in that teaching of good things, it is submission, the same submission that we find in Christ. Glory to God. Sound doctrine. Sound doctrine. So obedient to their own husbands. Obedient to their own husbands. That obedient, again, my dear friend, it is not our English word obey. I, I sometimes wonder why the writers or the translators of the King James Bible are given so much to male chauvinism. 
You see, the, uh, you can't escape the fact that the right that the translators of the KJV, if you are somebody who is totally given to KJV, the natural tendency will be for you to be uh, given to male chauvinism, except you begin to learn to go into the original text and begin to see that certain words that were just interpreted certain ways, you are just like, what happened here? Anyway, so that obedient there, it simply means it should have been translated the way every other thing has been translated everywhere else, submitted or be in submission to their own husband. Why? That the word of God be not blasphemed. Why does the wife submit to her husband? It's not because she's afraid that he might slap her. No. The wife's submission is so that the word of God is kept, in, uh, the integrity of the word of God is kept. In other words, that the conduct of the believer is consistent with the logos or the message of God in Christ. That message was that Christ did not consider himself. Instead, he considered us in that he became obedient unto death to die our death and to raise for our justification. Hallelujah. Now, so it, you know what is funny? It then said in Titus 3, 2, 6, young men likewise exhort to be sober. Oh, so young men likewise exhort to be sober. Likewise, likewise what? Likewise as the young women have been uh, exhorted. Let me say it again. What we tell the man is what we tell the woman because they both have the same spirit from the work of the same Lord by the love of the same father. Let me say that one more time. What we tell the husband and what we tell the wife is the same because they are expressing the same spirit, which is the work of the same Lord, an expression of the love of the father. The father is one. The work of his son is one. The spirit given is one, not twins. There is no male spirit, female spirit. There is one spirit. We endeavor to maintain the unity of the spirit, right? So what we tell the man, we tell him because of the spirit of God in him. What we tell the woman, we tell her because of the spirit of God in her. What is the spirit of God? The product of the sacrifice of Christ. So Titus 2, 6, young men likewise. So what we, what we tell the wife, is what we tell the husband because the message being communicated is the word of God. We don't want the word of God to be blasphemed. So we tell the husband, you see that mind that we are telling your wife to have? That soberness that serves, we are also telling you to have the same mind. In fact, you have the same mind. Now you to it. Be filled with the spirit. Yeah, submit yourself to your spouse. Why? She's a sister in law. That's the example in the Lord. That is what the Spirit is testifying of. Amen. Now, that's very, that's very important. That, therefore, look, but look at this. Look at Colossians 3. Colossians. Colossians and chapter 3. Are you there? Colossians chapter 3. And I'm going to read to you uh, verse 21. No, before that. Look at Ephesians. 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 Grebedi esnago, groducho, prastekio, kanglamba, gripato aferasca prakotonoske, yangla duduce, gripaduce freticos, nonska, pradekdi, shukdusto frefekepa panago dolungo, ha 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 
you will put on as the ones that are loved of God, a heart that serves, a persuasion unto love, a commitment unto the well-being of another, that the word of God might prevail, that the will of God might be done, that the purpose of God might stand, that the light might gain all momentum over the darkness, and that the glory of God fulfills the whole earth. Hallelujah. Now, so it says in Oh, what shall you do when in your heart you see that I, have, I hear these things and uh, I've heard about them. Oh, but I failed miserably. I did not, oh, I did not meet the target there or that target here. Oh, but you say to yourself, I'm not both going to beat myself black and blue, but I'm going to respond to the spirit of love within me. For you see, it is the spirit of God that these things are spoken by at all and about. So give yourself to the spirit. For you see, it is by the same activity that by which you yield in utterance, that you yield in thanksgiving, that you will yield in your dealings with one and the other. So give yourself over to these things and do not say, oh, I'm going to be so good at this by starting there. But start ye in giving yourself in edification and giving yourself in ministry of words and utterance unto the brother, unto the sister, and learn to allow your words to minister grace unto the hearers. And then you see you'll find out that in your expression in your daily expression you will look back and say I've come this far I've come I've walked in the light I'm walking in the light and the light is at work in me now you see do not give yourself over to despondency to discouragement or to fear but say to yourself I've got the victory that overcomes the world amen many 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 men now uh, Ephesians and chapter uh, 6 Ephesians 6 remember we're looking at Titus right Titus let me read that Titus to you again. Titus. Yeah, I'm being set up there. Look at Titus and chapter 2. It says that, verse 4, that they may teach the younger women to be sober. That means to be in their right mind, to think correctly. Right? Let me say it again. A, uh, feminism is not correct thinking for the believer. The, the believer, see, whatever feminism is trying to achieve for people, you find something better, yeah, in the life of sacrificing God. So we teach the younger women. It's not feminism we are teaching. We are teaching that correct mind, the sacrifice of Christ, which prefers the other, which never enslaves the other, which never will walk ill. The Bible says love will not walk ill on its neighbor. So the love of God in us will never walk ill to our neighbor. Mm -mm. It will not assume the worst. It will believe the worst. Now, Titus 2, 4, that they may teach the younger women to be sober, you know, men, there are many Christian women and some Christian men too that think that, uh, well, we better teach the women feminism. Not at all. Not at all. If anything, if the church was doing its job in teaching the saints about the love of God instead of tribalism, instead of all our national slants, there would, uh, uh, feminism would not have the grip that it has on the church world today. You see, uh, because what is often taught about man and woman is nothing other than slavery, subjugation, and the belittling of the woman, and by extension, the belittling of the man. No, instead, we are to teach the young woman to be sober. You see, sound doctrine, the teaching of good things, is brings the saint, the believer, into a sane way of thinking. Why? The sacrifice of Christ is divine logic. How to live so as to please another. How to live for the benefit of another, not to be consumed with selfishness. Now, Titus 2.4, that they may teach the younger women to be sober. To, that means to have husband love. Ah, somebody says, no, 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 you must have self-love. But you see, that's feminism. And that might make sense. Uh, sincerely, I have nothing against feminism. Because there are so many other kinds of teachings that are in the world today. Uh, they, uh, you know, you find people that are saying things like, oh, you're a feminist. Feminism is not correct. Yeah, and those people talk, talk about it as though teaching our children, our tribal culture, uh, and taking it to be the Bible is correct also. It's not. Yeah? So what do we do? We sweep it all by the side, and we teach our young women to be sober. Yeah, it is proper sobriety to teach a woman that there is no female spirit. There is no male spirit. There is no female savior. There is no male savior. There is no female redemption. There is no male redemption. 
There is only one spirit. There is only one sanctification. There is only one righteousness. There is only one belonging. There is only one sonship. There is only, do you understand? It's one. Okay, that is so bad. That has been right-minded. That in Christ, there's neither male nor female. Teach it that way, because that's what the Bible says. We don't elevate one gender above another, because when we do that, we are on Christ-like. It cannot be found in Christ Jesus. Oh, somebody says, it may not be found in Christ, it can be found at home. Then I, I, I submit to you, your, your home is antichrist. Your home needs to be a reflection of that same spirit, that same attitude found in Christ. What do we find in Christ? Neither Jew, nor Gentile, nor born, nor free. Neither, you understand? That is neither male nor female. Is he saying that there are no more girls and no more boys? Uh, of course not. They are male and they are female. What he's saying is that the basis of belonging in Christ is not gender. The basis of our privileges in Christ is not along gender lines. There are no male privileges in the epistles. Let me say one more time. The epistles does not confer gender privileges. The epistle confers the, uh, the responsibility of saints who may be female or male. And the epistles are not against maleness and not against femaleness. The epistles are for Christness. Hallelujah. So the epistles are about Christness, and, and that is how maleness finds its peak. Let me say it again. The peak of womanhood is Christ. The peak of manhood is Christ. Any definition of manhood or definition of womanhood that cannot be found in Christ is a full bar. That means it is a total misnomer. It's acceptable to the world, but not acceptable in the church. It is not suba. My dear friends, wika pota fike, weke tipa hogo, sipa ho ho hola, sapa hole hiha kosko, som pratiko ostokuruste, sipra ketisto, groko, limando, lipatre, sisteko. There's coming a, a group of men. There is coming a group of women. They shall be explorers in things supernatural. They shall be explorers in things divine. They shall be explorers in the realm of light. They will be explorers in the mercy of God. They will be, oh, men and women given to an acute awareness of the operation of the spirit of God in men. These shall be called spirit technicians. They will be strong and deft. They will be wise and they will be smart. They will be learned and they will be knowledgeable in the working of the spirit of God in a man. And they will be able to set things right that are crooked. And they will be able to reason in line with the resurrected Lord. And the work of God will be done. And the light shall progress further. And the nations shall be covered with the glory of the Son of God. And men shall be seen walking in a fresh revelation. Men and women walking in a fresh revelation of that teaching by the spirit of God of a new logic, of a new intelligence, of a new mind, of a new consciousness that the man in Christ is the man that wins at the victory of God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Now, Titus 2 and verse 4, it says that they may teach the young women to be sober. So the church, see, what is soberness? Soberness in context is the teaching of good things. In verse 1, it is sound doctrine. You see, any kind of redemption that doesn't make it into your bedroom, it is uh, it is. Uh, 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 an unpractical, non, uh, non-workable redemption, real redemption, well, will change the heart of a man, will put the spirit of God in a man, will follow the man into the workplace, will follow the man into every relationship, will follow the man to the bedroom with his wife. Yeah, redemption. It will follow the man and the woman into the kitchen. It changes everything. Hallelujah. Now, it says, the, it says that they may teach the young women to be sober. What a shame it is, you see, that in the church, somehow, we manage to teach our young boys from a young age up, right, to have a sense of superiority over our girls, right, to have a sense of, a, 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 a sense of entitlement. But no, there is nothing that entitles a man to more than a woman in the redemption of Christ. Moreover, the basis of entitlement is not male or female, it is spirit. Spirit is the uh, heredity of God. It is the basis of inheritance. It is how we get our correct mind. Hallelujah. See, it says in Titus 2.4 that they may teach. It's to be a teaching. It's to be, it, 
Think about it carefully. You wonder why we don't teach these things. And somebody says, oh, I'm going to teach about salvation. I'm telling you again, the knowledge of salvation is the foundation for what we are teaching. Because if, you, if our teaching on salvation does not affect influence or, or elevate our relationship with others, then our, so our salvation understanding is deficient. Now, so it says, and it calls it sound doctrine. What is sound doctrine? The teaching we give to a wife as a sister, the, which puts a woman in a correct mind. Right, that as a gift that she gives, there is a husband law. In that gift, there's a child law. Uh, it is actually a submission to her own husband. And then in verse six, it says, "Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded." Likewise. So what Paul said for uh, verse four and five, he says to the to the man also. So we have to teach the young men to be sober, to love their wives, to love their children. Right? We have to teach it to them. So we teach our Christian men wife love. We teach our Christian, uh, or we teach our Christian men, husbands, we teach them child love. Ah, somebody says, no, 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 no. You see, uh, I don't know about that. Uh, the taking care of a child is a duty of a woman. You are not sober. You are not sober. You are not. See, a Christian, a sober man, will understand that there's a teaching called child love. Right, there's a teaching called wife law, right? Just like for the woman, you know, it's very funny. A woman that takes the natural inclination of the woman into taking care of a child might not necessarily be doing it in the spirit in which a believer should do it, but there is a slant, a mindedness, a correctness of thinking, right? In which the husband, wife is to do it. Let me say it again a wife taking care of her husband is simply a, a, a practice of submission. She's doing it as a service in the Lord. And if they have children, she's taking care of the children as a service in the Lord. And then it says, otherwise, if it's not done, the word of God will be blasphemed or spoken against. What is it that is speaking against it? The way that the believer is acting. Verse 6, young men likewise, exhort to be sober, to be sober-minded. Young men likewise, exhort to be sober-minded. I do not wonder, think about it. Why is the divorce rate in the church exactly like the divorce rate in the world? It is because it is the same sentiment that governs societies and tribes of men. It's the same, uh, uh, it's the same looseness that, that governs the world, that people are preaching on the pulpits and people are practicing in their marriages. You know, the domination by, of one gender by the other, the enslavement of each other. But that's not what the Word of God teaches. The Word of God teaches us to be a servants to one another as a gift. My service to my wife is meant to be my gift to her. Just like a service to me is meant to be a gift to me. And this is what we teach the young men so that they can be found sober. A man who is not taught these things is not sober. It's like a drunkard. A woman who is not taught these things is a, is a drunkard. Yeah, let me say it again. There are many things that look like this, but they are not this because the basis is not the sacrifice of Christ. We are teaching submission from the basis of the love of God, from the basis of the sacrifice of Christ. Notice, I have not once said that the woman submits to the man because there is something in men that should be submitted to. That is a whole, bo is a whole, uh, is a whole mountain of beans. It amounts to nothing, right? No, get it right. In our traditional culture, that is our culture. In our culture, the, uh, the man is made to feel like a swollen-headed fellow. You see, and those things were told to me too as a young boy. You know, some people don't understand that. Uh, they think, ah, maybe Seku just drop from heaven. I didn't drop from heaven. No. I have my mistakes and my flaws. And I was told and taught things too as a young boy. You know, but you, you know, there's something, there's a sense. You know? When you begin to read the epistle, it resets your brain. It gives you sense. You know, sound mind or sound doctrine or, or the teaching of good things is a brain reset in Christ. Just resets you. Right, in that it begins to let you have the mind of a servant for the Matthew 20 28 that the Son of Man did not come to be served but to, to serve. And if I am in the Son of Man or the Spirit of the Son is in me, then I have not come into marriage to be served. So, a man that tells his wife, Ah, your place is in the kitchen, no, our place is in Christ. 
just like your place is in Christ. And in Christ, you then find service for one another. Amen. You find service for one another. Glory to God. You find service for one another. Now, let me say one more time. You see, we, we act, that is a sober mind. Young men likewise exhort to be sober. He's not saying take what they told you, your traditional wedding, and come and repeat it to each other. No. It is a teaching we come to church that we are taught these things, and it is a resetting of our brains. Let me say one more time. In Titus 2.4, a, let me say it again. A woman that assumes that the natural instincts of motherhood is the practice of a Christian mother is not necessarily correct. There is motherly instinct, but motherly instinct often is lopsided. It is, I now give all my attention to the baby and I neglect my husband. But there is a sacrifice, a life of sacrifice in Christ that says husband love is husband love. Child love is not husband love. But child love is unique in itself and is to be practiced. So there's a child love and there's a husband love. And for the, for the man, there's a wife love and there's a child love too. They are taught the same thing. A submission by the Spirit of God. Now, I want you to see something. Look at Ephesians 6, 4. I want you to see Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. When the Bible says in Titus 2, 6, that the young men likewise should be taught. What is the likewise? Paul taught it. Ephesians 6. Look at Ephesians 6. Verse 4, you fathers, one more time, you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. That is child love. So child love of a husband will be that he will not provoke his children to wrath. So what should be the big thing in the mind of a parent? I hope I'm not provoking my children to rot. Ah, no, 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 no. I will never spare the, I will never spare anything it takes to, to beat them black and blue. I must show them who is the master in this house. Let me say it again. The Bible can be read in such a way that you will kill your child. Let me say it again. The Bible can be read in such a way that in reading the Bible, you will use it as a dangerous book to push your children into provocation that gets them into rot. All the while, you'll be quoting scripture. Only that the scripture is actually being interpreted in ways to damage your kids. That is not child love. See, learn as a parent, as a father. In this case, Ephesians 6, 4. You fathers, provoke not your children to rot. You know, I don't know about you. I mean, I, I, I've seen people with young children. I, I, we have young, uh, young kids too. We've had a, a period when our kids were much younger. And you understand that uh, you will ask Paul, Paul, are you sure you are okay? <laughs> Should you not be telling the children, don't provoke your parents? Is that not? But that's not what Paul said. Paul is talking about child, uh, uh, about child love. A father's development in child love. Let me tell you, nobody, no believer, right, starts out understanding child love. You are trained in it. What people will tell you naturally will just make you a monster to your children. They don't have a voice. They don't have a say. They don't have desires. They can't have a preference. Everything is, I am the adult in this place. And what I say goes. And think about it. Is that the way the Heavenly Father is father you, fathering you? Yeah? You know that song, Father me. I love the way you father. Now, is that the way that the Father God is with us? Of course not. You see, let me tell you again. Uh, as fathers, we must unlearn what our tribes have taught us and sit down as brothers in Titus 2.6. And we learn child love, what it is to love your child in the love of God, in the sacrifice of Christ. Let me tell you again. The love of a father for his children, we mean he is the one sacrificing more. When they are the ones sacrificing more, something is amiss. Because when it came to the relationship of Christ and us, he sacrificed, we enjoyed. So Ephesians 6, 4, you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up. That means you are up too. If you are not mature, you see, a child can be the father of a child. That means a, a man, a, biology, a man who biologically has all the uh, chemical compositions that can impregnate a woman can get another woman pregnant. That is not a biblical father. A biblical father is somebody who has self-control. He is not a provoker who provokes the children onto rot. He says, instead, what does he do? He's a nurturer. He brings them up in the nurture. 
Now, let me tell you, where, where did the father learn to nurture? Go back to chapter 5, Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5. Where did the father learn to nurture? As a husband, they learned it. Where do we find it? We find it in verse 29, Ephesians 5. For no man yet ate his own flesh, but nourished and cherished it, even as the Lord the church. That's where a man begins to learn how to be a nurturer, a grower, a developer. Right? Somebody that you see him and you see his wife actually achieving her full potential. But what is the traditional idea? Uh, a man is born into this world with a dream. And the woman is, uh, is sent to him to make sure that his dream come to pass. A dream is to make sure that he has a dream. And if it doesn't, and once uh, she doesn't have a dream, she doesn't have any voice, she doesn't have, uh, no, 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 that's not true. And you know what is funny? Men that are that way often take that same idea into parenting. So it says in Ephesians 6, 4, I'm going to show you Titus 2, 6 in demonstration that Paul actually taught. So I'm trying to give an idea of when the Bible says that there is sound doctrine, that you teach unto the brothers, the young brothers, about child love is in Ephesians 6, Ephesians 6, 4. You fathers provoke not your children to rot. Instead, do you do what? Bring them up. So how can we tell that a father is doing a good job? The children are going up. So up in what? Uh, says now, so up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Let me say it again. Uh, so a, a father understands that if he leaves everything as it is naturally, he will provoke his children to rot. He will. Otherwise, Paul would have no reason to address it. So if you do what comes to you naturally, you provoke your children to rot. So you have to do what comes to you by teaching. What does that teaching do? It reminds me as a father. Reminds me, before I become a father, it reminds me as the husband of a wife. It reminds me as a brother right, about the love of God that trains and nurtures and nourishes and cherishes and cleanses me. Glory to God. So, uh, if I look at Colossians, Colossians 3, Colossians and chapter 3, I'm going to read to you uh, verse uh, 21. Colossians 3 and verse 21. See what it says. It says, uh, fathers, provoke not your children toward anger. In other words, a father makes sure that the anger he's seen in his children did not come from him. Ah, no, somebody says, no, but Pastor Sheku, it, it is the, there's a foolishness in the heart of a child. It's true. Where do you think a child gets the foolishness from? <laughs> Let me see one more time. It is true that there's foolishness in the heart of a child. Was the child born foolish? Or is the child not trained in the excuses of the parents? In the parents refuse not to walk in love? So somebody says, ah, the foolishness is out of the church. I might use a rod to drive it out. What is the rod you should use? Somebody says, ah, yes, it's a cane. Does God use physical cane on you? Ah, no, somebody says, ah, Pastor, I don't know about that. You want me to spoil my children? Ah, why don't you be a believer first? Believe in your words. Believe in your, does God slap you when you make a mistake? Then what is this thing that makes parents slap their children? Ah, no, but Pastor, no, no. You, look, you, you are just very Chinese. <laughs> No, as a father, you must learn to apologize to your children because unlike Christ, you make mistakes. Christ doesn't make mistakes. So in the love of Christ, you will apologize to your children plenty so that in your apology, they learn to apologize too. In your repentance, they know to repent. So fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. According to Paul, the chief source of discouragement for children is in their parents. Simple. So I said, ah, no, you're not like me. I'm never discouraged. No, as a parent, just do a check up for yourself. Anyway, but I'm trying to tell you that these are the things that we teach as sound doctrine. Sound doctrine. Be careful that what you're fighting in your child is not yourself, and that your child has watched you and has drank into the waters of who you are. So how then do you help a child that has drank into the wrong waters? You change before the child. You, because what do children do? They are imitators. Yeah, Ephesians 5.1. Yeah, as dear children, imitate God. So children are imitators. You see, children are not, uh, they are people that are influenced by what you do. So what do you do? When you notice that you've been PhD discouragement and PhD anger, change to become PhD love. Become PhD tenderness. You are firm, but it proceeds from tenderness. Because after all, you are the child of God, and you know how often you mess up, and how often does God slap you? 
I don't know about you. It, 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 see, when we do things, contrary to the way God does them, the gospel, the word of God is blasphemed. Amen. So let me say one more time. Uh, and that is the same way we are as husbands and wives. Look at, in fact, that Colossians 3, look at what he said again. I'm trying to explain Titus 2.6. When he, when he says, and the young men likewise. Look at uh, 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 Colossians 3, verse 19. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter, 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 bitter against them. So as a smart Christian, what do you do a checkup on? I hope I'm not bitter. That means, a, see, a bitter man, see, the natural thing to develop in a man over time for, from listening to tradition and culture and the society around him is that he will become an expert at hiding bitterness towards his wife. What is the one thing that can uproot it? Sound doctrine. The teaching of good things, submission. Yeah. So that means a husband is to know that it is as easy to be bitter as it is to love. Where would the man be bitter when he's busy quoting, my daddy said, my mommy said, my uncle said, my grandmother said, uh, 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 Napoleon Bonaparte said, uh, you know, whatever. You know, that kind of fellow. He cannot quote Christ. He cannot quote the sacrifice of Christ. The same way to the husband, the wife. Uh, the wife said, my mommy. My, my mommy said, my daddy said, my uncle. No, why don't you start saying, in the sacrifice of Christ, I've seen this example. In the sacrifice of Christ, I've seen it. Now, on, on the other, on the other uh, hand, these things do not just come to the mind naturally. They have to be taught. Hence, why we are teaching it. It is submission. The husband's submission to his wife is simply that he will not be bitter. Let me say one more time. Colossians 3.19 helps us understand a dimension of uh, submission. That the husband's submission to his wife, he will not be bitter towards her. Instead, he will be sacrificial, he will give himself. The wife's submission is that he will see it as a fitting thing in God to notice him, to defer to him, to celebrate him, to speak well to him, right? To hold him in the highest esteem and regard. Why? That is the way that God holds us. Somebody says, ah, notice what I didn't say. I did not say that the ego of men craves respect. You have not heard that from me. I'm not teaching you... Uh, uh, psychology or general science. We're not teaching guidance counseling. No, it is not the ego of boys we are talking about. We are talking about the love of God in Christ. And well, the, the natural language of women is that they want this. And then the natural language of men is that they want that. No, no, we're not talking about the natural language. We are talking about the example of God in Christ. What is fitting in the Lord? Can you see it? Colossians 3.18. Wives, uh, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Not according to the tabloid or the latest magazine or the latest arguments or the latest words from grandma, grandpa, grand uncle, great grand auntie or the cockroach in your house. No, it is to be as the fitting thing in God, the fitting thing in the Lord. What, what do we see in the Lord? Although he's Lord, he's Lord as our servant. He serves us for our good. He's not selfish or self-centered. He's not uh, self-seeking. He actually operates for our good. That he, the Bible says, in the new no sin was made sin for us, that we may be made the righteousness of God. That is an act of service. That means we do not consider the things of ourselves, but we focus on that which actually benefits and grows others spiritually. Well, guys, look, it's been a pleasure to bring you the word of God tonight. <laughs> and uh, that was quite some interesting.